Welcome. My name is Dr. Michael Brooks from the Department of History at Bowling Green State University. In this lecture, we'll be examining some of the major uh, trends in historiography in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We will discuss a few historians who have been particularly influential in the development of the modern field of history as an academic discipline. Uh, before we begin, though, I should add two caveats. Uh, first, you may notice that most of the individuals profiled in this video and in this lecture series are males of European descent. Uh, this does not necessarily reflect bias on my part, uh, but it does illustrate an uncomfortable truth about the field of history. Uh, that is, up until the last uh, decades of the 20th century, uh, this was a field that was completely dominated by white males. Um, secondly, consider that there are many dozens of historians I could have chosen to profile at different parts of this lecture, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm limiting myself to just a few examples. So uh, anyone who feels uh, left out, um, my apologies to you. Uh, let us then begin by examining some of the people who helped the field of history emerge as a significant academic discipline. We will begin our look at the evolution of the field of history in what might seem to be an unusual place with Karl Marx. Marx was a 19th century German philosopher and economist whose work influenced many academic fields. For Karl Marx, reality is material in essence, consisting of matter and energy. As Marx viewed history, there were no gods or no supernatural phenomena. For Marx, uh, historical materialism was the basis by which history moved. Um, the world's resources, in, uh, in Marx's view, were scarce. Class struggle, then, is uh, primarily economic and material in nature. Those who are the owners are reluctant to give up what they possess, and those who do not own seek access and control of resources. There are a number of key components of Marxist analysis that have relation to the field of history. Marx, for example, was influential in promoting the idea of dividing history into periods and dividing society into socioeconomic classes. Marx described the origin of economic value in terms of the labor used to produce goods and services. Marx argued that surplus value, which we might today call profit, was value added to a good or service by laborers over and above the cost of the wages of the laborers. Marx was also one of the first writers to take a scientific approach to understanding history, society, and economics, and he was finally known for a mode of analysis known as dialectical materialism. The concept of dialectical materialism is based on something known as the Hegelian dialectic, which examines the evolution of ideas. Marx, however, applied the Hegelian model to the physical world to explain economic and historical change. So under the Hegelian dialectic, as you can see in this drawing, um, and the, the Hegelian dialectic would be um, represented in the, the white boxes. So the thesis uh, meets an antithesis. The clash between these ideas results in something called a synthesis, which then becomes the new thesis, and a new antithesis arises, they clash, they form a new synthesis, and the, this goes on ad infinitum. Marx took this idea and um, used it to explain the change in history. So um, in this example, feudal lords um, clashing with serfs and peasants. Uh, the result of that is uh, the, the emergence of city life in the late medieval period. Um, guilds rise as the new antithesis to the uh, elites in cities. Um, this leads to the rise of an entrepreneurial class. In opposition to the entrepreneurial class rises the proletariat and eventually uh, Marx would argue a uh, classless society would finally emerge. Auguste Comte was a 19th century French philosopher and a sociologist whose work influenced many academic fields and also late 19th century politics as well. Comte is uh, best known as the founder of a philosophy of science known as positivism. This philosophy maintains that human societies, like the physical world, operate in accordance with general laws. Positivism led to the field of sociology and the application 
of the scientific method to society and history, or at least to explain them. According to Comte, human thought evolved in three stages. Uh, the theological stage, uh, nature is explained in terms of divinities or uh, spirits. During the metaphysical phase or stage of human evolution, uh, nature was explained in terms of abstract principles or mysterious abstract forces. Uh, and these replaced supernatural forces as the powers that explained the workings of the world. And finally, the positive uh, stage or the scientific stage, nature is explained in terms of descriptions. Scientific explanation uh, based on observation, experiment, and comparison. And this, uh, this field had significant influence on the field of history, as we will see. Charles Darwin, as you probably know already, was an English scientist a botanist who uh, developed a highly influential theory of biological evolution. His work indirectly but profoundly affected the field of history in addition to scientific uh, disciplines. Evolution, according to Darwin, occurs through natural selection. Human beings are animal in nature under Darwin's theories and they were not created by God. And this, uh, this de-emphasization of religion in explaining the history of life, and by extension, history itself, um, proved to be very influential in the field of history. No longer were historians thinking in terms, of, at least in an academic sense, thinking in terms of, of uh, history being driven by God or providential history. Social Darwinism is a term most closely associated with the work of Herbert Spencer, whose most influential work was the 1862 book First Principles of a New System of Philosophy. It is Spencer, by the way, that gives us the phrase survival of the fittest, which is sometimes attributed to, uh, to Darwin. Societies, according to Spencer, start out in a primitive state and gradually become more civilized over time. Uh, he looked at the powerful British Empire as a sort of proof of his theory. Progress, thus, in Spencer's views, was associated with the adoption of Western culture and Western technology. Societies that did not adopt Western culture and technology would not evolve and would remain in a primitive state or barbaric state. History then uh, reflected a gradual move toward the progress, in quotes, progress in quotation marks, that could be found in Western European nations. Spencer's work is also associated with what became known as scientific racism, an attempt to justify um, white supremacy and or European imperialism by distorting the scientific method in an attempt to prove the superiority of European culture. The scientific racism has been wholly discredited since that time, but in the late 19th and early 20th centuries it was widely accepted among scholars in the West. The idealist school can be uh, starkly contrasted with earlier attempts to use scientific methods to explain history. Uh, some general concepts of the idealist school would be as follows. History is not a natural science. History does not repeat. It's not cyclical. Historians are stuck in the present and are unlikely to be able to ever break free of the present to accurately describe the past. Historical truth is difficult, or perhaps, depending on the idealist, uh, impossible to achieve. Typical of the idealist school is R.G. Collingwood, picture here, whose book The Idea of History rejected attempts to make history more scientific. The idea of history was published after Collingwood's death and was cobbled together from a variety of his writings. All history, according to Collingwood, is the history of thought. History is a study of events, but only those events related to thoughts and actions from those thoughts. And it, it, primarily, it is the thoughts of the historians that are behind um, narrative history, as it's uh, depicted. Historical understanding, um, according to Collingwood, requires a reenactment of past experience. We can't just look at documents and uh, determine what happened. Memory should not be trusted since it's fallible, and Collingwood would argue that nature cannot have history since it lacks a mind. The study of history um, would be considered the study of the human mind as much as the past. Finally, Collingwood um, railed against what he called scissors and paste history. 
where historians simply quote sources without understanding the ideas behind the thoughts of the writer. Um, these scissors and paste historians, argued Collingwood, permitted their own beliefs to guide their own research, and they often neglected evidence that did not fit their preconceived notions, and very often were not even aware of these uh, biases or notions. Leopold von Ranke was a 19th century German historian who emphasized source-based history and narrative history. Von Ranke um, urged historians to describe historical events as they really were, or as they actually were. Um, sometimes considered to be the inventor of modern history, although some of his uh, methodologies have been discredited since that point in time. Um, he did transform um, history into a much more modern academic discipline um, as a university-based field, as an archive-centered field, um, pushing for the development of professional standards. Um, his emphasis on documents, though, um, is, is somewhat discredited these days. He, again, he's, he's approaching this in some ways as a more scientific um, field than it really should be. Von Ranke was also a practitioner of what uh, became known as German historicism. Um, these historicists argue that historians must place themselves inside the minds of past actors, uh, that they must be biased free, bias free, excuse me, or at least conscious of their biases. Gustav von Schmuller being an exemplar of German historicism. We turn next um, to Frederick Jackson Turner, who taught at the uh, University of Wisconsin and Harvard University. Um, he's most famous for an 1893 paper entitled The Significance of the Frontier in American History, which was uh, presented at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, 1893. In the early 19th century, Many Americans thought it would be 500 years or more before the West would be settled. However, by the 1890 census, the frontier, at least um, bureaucratically or in an official sense, was considered to be settled. Um, this had many Americans concerned that what would happen um, once we ran out of free land. Now, again, free in quotation marks because it wasn't free in the sense that other people, namely Native Americans, had been living on it. Um, and Turner was very concerned about what would happen when we ran out of frontier. So in Turner's eyes, the hazards of the frontier made Americans tough, made Americans inventive, made Americans independent. American history, Turner would argue, is a series of frontiers, uh, dealing with Native Americans, with fur traders, uh, cowboys, pioneer farmers. This was where American history really uh, happened. This is where the American character was formulated. Uh, the settlement of the West was thus something of a continuous rebirth of uh, American society. Some suggest that the Turner thesis uh, might be considered the uh, initial theoretical basis for what would later be termed American imperialism. Certainly the timing is intriguing as the thesis did arrive shortly before the Spanish-American War and before the ramp up of American military and colonization actions in the Pacific, the Caribbean, and Latin America as the 20th century dawned. Um, it may be an overstatement to attempt to pin American imperialism solely at the feet of Turner. Next we take a look at Oswald Spengler, a German historian and philosopher. His work should be viewed within the context of a post-World War I world. Um, it is very much um, a work of economic determinism. Uh, this is a form of cyclical history, and his most famous work was uh, The Decline of the West. This is a two-volume work, um, and uh, very reflective of the times in which the, the work emerged. Um, Spengler argued that cultures go through predictable and cyclical periods of rise and fall. He outlined um, historical examples of major civilizations. The 20th century, he argued, was the start of the Western decline 
and uh, he didn't point so much at uh, any particular reason other than um, this was predictable. It was almost a scientific um, pattern that history followed. Uh, Spengler was very anti-liberal, at least in the classical liberal sense, very anti-democratic. Um, some like to draw comparisons between Spengler and the Nazis. Initially, they, they kind of shared some similar um, philosophical beliefs, but uh, Spengler would later um, fall out of favor with the Nazis in the 1930s. Finally, we turn to what is known as the Historical Revisionist School. In the early 20th century, a number of American historians began publishing work that challenged orthodox interpretations of history. I should note here that we are discussing historical revisionism as a legitimate line of inquiry and not the work of practitioners of Holocaust denial who uh, like to use the term historical revision to describe their efforts to minimize, normalize, or uh, deny the historical reality of the Holocaust. The historical revisionists sometimes emphasize newly discovered documents in their examinations of history, but often they instead produce new interpretations of existing uh, evidence. Among the most famous of the historical revisionist school was uh, Harry Barnes, pictured on the left in the 1920s. Um, he denied that Germany was solely responsible for World War I. This view was highly unpopular in the United States, France, and Britain. C. Hartley Grattan, in a 1929 book, argued that World War I was largely driven by propaganda, especially British propaganda. Uh, Charles Beard, depicted on the left, um, long maintained that FDR was actively promoting U.S. involvement in the Second World War, challenging uh, that orthodox interpretation that we were um, sort of innocent victims. Beard um, probably is more noteworthy, though, for his 1913 work, an economic interpretation of the Constitution of the United States, in which he argued that the economic self-interests of the members of the Constitutional Convention influenced the way that they voted. Now, these uh, revisionist historians in, in many ways have fallen out of favor in the last few decades, but I think they're very important in um, setting a precedent for um, allowing future historians to um, legitimately question what uh, might be considered to be received wisdom of earlier historians. Now, this brings to a close our look at historiographical trends in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Stay tuned for the second half of the lecture.